Hey friends, welcome to No More Silos with me, Erica Santiago. This podcast is all about the intersection of culture and Christianity from my perspective as an African-American Christian woman, and not necessarily in that order. No More Silos is all about breaking down and overcoming the barriers of compartmentalized information to help us connect the dots between the Bible, history, culture, tradition, and worldviews. So join me today for a new episode as our journey continues. Follow me on Instagram at Cultural Christianity and please share and subscribe to this podcast. Uh, With all that's going on in the world, you don't want to miss a single episode. Thanks for listening. Hey everybody, welcome back to No More Silos. My name is Erica Santiago and this is my podcast on cultural Christianity where I attempt to help us figure out how to merge the information from the various silos of our lives, of our knowledge, sources, you know, just understand what we believed at No More Silos, what we've been having for the last few years, and welcome to season three, by the way, what we've been having is an ongoing conversation about where our ideas come from. This past summer, we had a lot of folks writing about Christian nationalism, specifically white Christian nationalism. And in season one, we covered that topic. Uh, We've also had uh, questions about, you know, where our ideas come from when it comes to discipleship. And that's been especially important in Bible study discussions, as sometimes we think our ideas come from scripture, and then we learn that they don't. And we talked a little bit about that in season two. And so here we are in season three. So in today's episode, we're we're going to be talking about what's involved in deconstructing to reconstruct. And I want to share with you some thoughts that I saw on on Twitter and a couple of books that address this, I think, uh, pretty well. And I also want to tell you about uh, my new Patreon account, uh, No More Silos Podcast. You can find us on Patreon here at No More Silos. This season is about reconstructing our faith. And so today we're going to talk about deconstruction to reconstruct. And in our next episode next week, we're going to talk about some of the books and resources that I've personally been using to reconstruct my faith this past year. Not that that my faith was in shambles or anything, but I, I want to give you some guidelines on what is a safe book look like. So let's get started. Let's talk about what it means to deconstruct. Deconstruction has become a one of those words like critical race theory. It is a word that, depending upon your position, how you center yourself or how you see Christianity in America, deconstruction is either a good thing or a bad thing. It's a bad thing when you're in a position of power and you feel that your power is slipping away. It's a bad thing if you feel that you are your you and your culture are centered and you realize that you are not the center of the universe and you feel that slipping away. And in that context it's similar to uh, CRT, similar to critical race theory. But the other context is looking at it from the standpoint of how do I embody my faith from my perspective? How do I see myself in the story of God? How do I view myself and others like me through the lens of the gospel? What does that really mean to me? And there have been a number of theologians on Twitter. And, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that I, um, I've been a little disappointed, honestly, in the last several months with what's going on on Twitter. But there, are, I, if it weren't for Twitter, I would not have been able to do a search and follow people who are uh, black theologians, white theologians, female theologians, male theologians, people who are looking at the world through the lens of the gospel and how they view that. And then even the arguments, some of them are academic arguments, some of them are uh, just simply discussions, some of them are just questions. And so when I think of cultural Christianity in this podcast, No More Silos, and I guess this is part of what kind of delayed me in getting season three off the ground, has been really trying to think through, okay, I'm in the middle of what I, for the last few years, and that's what took me to seminary, and now I'm almost done with my doctorate, uh, 
deconstructing my faith because I realized some of the things that I had built my faith upon through no fault of my own, it's just the culture I live in, the Christian culture I, I've, I've grown up in, really didn't have as much to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ as I thought it did. And so I want to tell you, if you are still on Twitter, you can definitely check out uh, what I call theology Twitter. Um, and it's folks that have written, who have written books that I read, and I'll share those uh, in a moment. Uh, the books that I've read in the last few years, books that I've read in uh, my theology classes, ministry classes, books that uh, you know someone mentioned, that's how I find out about a lot of this stuff. And so it's really, really helpful. One of the things that um, I'm actually pulling up Instagram right now because it was a tweet, but this person shared their tweet on Instagram. So I'm trying to get to my saved, I save everything on Instagram. And it's actually kind of interesting sometimes because I can go back and I'm like, I really like the way they said that. Um, like I saved this quote the other day, but it says it's from Stephen Lawson. I have no idea who that is, but, um, Someone named uh, Her Biblical Worldview posted this quote on Instagram, and she said, Jesus is not interested in big religious crowds. He already had one, and it crucified him. He wants disciples. And in season two, we talked a lot about discipleship. So here's what I, I want to share with you. Candace Benbow, uh, Candace Marie Benbow, um, she wrote Red Lip Theology, and I definitely want to encourage you to get that book, uh, get her book, uh, and also Truth's Tables book. Uh, those were two very, um, I th- to me, profound resources for black women in American Christianity this past year, I think are, are really good researches. So there's your first two books, uh, Truth's Table and uh, Candace Benbow's book, uh, Red Lip Theology. But Candace said this on Twitter the other day. Uh, she said, one of my main critiques of the current theological deconstructionist movement is that it has no real analysis of black liberation theology or any real praxis for dismantling the whiteness it consistently centers. A hamster wheel of sorts, DEI spirituality and vibes. Another reason why current deconstruction deconstruction movements frustrate me is because all so many of his leaders know how to do is critique and deconstruct. Why? because it's largely an academic exercise. They can tell you what's wrong with the church and doing so is sexy. It brings with it a following. Hell, my first blog was called Selah and Amen, Righteous Critique. So I get it, I do. But we must offer people more. And when that doesn't happen, that's when it's clear that deconstruction movements aren't rooted in a liberationist ethic, but are just a thinly veiled multicultural spiritualism that still grounds whiteness. This is why people stay in the trap of deconstructing. If the bulk of your conversation or time is spent still talking about the sin of white supremacy and you have no plan for moving forward and establishing healthy spiritual frameworks and practices to replace the toxic ones, you could be stuck in the trap of deconstructing. Let me put my cards on the table and just say that I hate the word deconstruction because it's so trendy and white-centered, but get this. Learning or unlearning is a lifelong project. Zora said there are years that ask the questions and years that answer. That is so true. One of the major imperatives to establish Red Lip Theology came because of a conversation Raquel and I had in our last year at Duke 2015 when she asked me to po- ask me point blank, if you're, uh, if you're always everything black women believe, or if you away everything black women believe, what will they have left? I never forgot that. Because more than a question, it was a reminder of who we are and what our faith means to us. What does it mean to be stuck in deconstruction when we are a resurrection people? I mean, did he get up or not? Nah? Did he not say, destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days? There's a reason Leviticus comes after Exodus. You've got to rebuild and establish new norms after leaving old systems. That is the beautiful work of faith. 
And a lot of people aren't helping folk to do that work faithfully. Everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. I hope this year people continue to find the right resources and people step out of the hamster wheel of deconstruction as it's been presented to them and move toward more generative possibilities of faith and wholeness. Wow, that is a whole word right there. You see, friends, we are deconstructing, but deconstruction is not the end of the story. It's the beginning. So in the next episode, I'm going to share resources for reconstructing your faith, but I want to talk about some of the things that come with moving from deconstruction to reconstruction. As Candace points out, it is important not to get stuck in a constant stage or phase of complaining about the status or the structure or uh, it's always the man. It's one of the things that we talked about in the episode on uh, on humanism, where I talked about spiritual formation and um, you know who do people believe Jesus is. One of the things that really was interesting to me recently, I, I listened to another podcast. Uh, it's called The Holy Post. And one of the folks on that podcast, Sky Jatani, has written a number of books. He talks about, or he has a series of books called Was Jesus Serious? And in his book, Was Jesus Serious? He recounts in the introduction how he had been teaching a class on the Sermon on the Mount at his church a number of years ago. And the feedback he got from the participants in this class was that the ideals that Jesus was teaching or the commands he was giving in the Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 through 7, uh, that's the longest uh, version of it. It's also in Luke's gospel. But he learned from the participants that they found what Jesus was saying was kind of optional. Like, this is the ideal that you want to get to, but it's not realistic. And I agreed with Sky Jatani on this, that it's troubling. Just like Candace was pointing out that if we, we get stuck on this in this place of not really believing the gospel, but believing the gospel. Like, are we really resurrection people? Are we really believing? I mean, the whole point of Christianity is in in the followers of the way was that Jesus got up. And so if he got up and we believe his word to be true, uh, then we, from a discipleship standpoint, we should be actually following what he said do. And so I want you to take time this week to read the Sermon on the Mount. You can read it just in Matthew, um, maybe listen to it on your Bible app, uh, chapters 5 through 7. Jesus covers the, uh, the Lord's, what we call the Lord's Prayer. He covers the Beatitudes. He talks um, about lust. He, t- he really, he covers a lot of different things. And what's interesting, and this is why I call theology, what I have dubbed theology Twitter, why I think it's so interesting to read what other theologians are writing about, people who are actively in ministry or professors or writing books or writing blogs, why I find all of that interesting is because that's how I find out about the the books or the other podcasts that are out there. And one of the, one of the things that Let's see, where do I want to start? Because I have like four or five books right in front of me. So the big, the big deconstructionist book, if you are married, has been The Great Sex Rescue by Sheila Gregoire and her daughter and a status, a professional statistician. What we learn from The Great Sex Rescue, and I think I talk about it in season two, and where it has uh, caught on in modern American Christianity, is that it echoes what John Mark Comer talks about in his book that came out last, I think it was last year, Live No Lies. Uh, The subtitle of it is Recognize and Resist the Three Enemies That Sabotage Your Peace. And I shared here on the podcast a message that I delivered at my church, at our church, last year about the ruthless elimination of hurry, which is another book by John Mark Comer. But in this book, No More Lies, he talks about his theory as followers of Jesus, we're at war with the world, the flesh and the devil, and the three enemies uh, of this, the way that it works is this. This is his theory, and this is how he navigates this book. 
And so when you think about it from uh, deconstructing to reconstructing, think about it in this context. So he starts with the devil, deceptive ideas. We see that in Genesis uh, when the serpent uh, gaslights Adam and Eve. We also see it in the devil's attempt to gaslight Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. So deceptive ideas. Then he says, that play to disordered desires, disordered desires, the flesh, what we think we want. Um, And then the next part is the world. And he says that are normalized in a sinful society. So as I mentioned at the very beginning of today's episode, cultural Christianity is an ongoing conversation that I've been having with folks about where our ideas come from. This has been especially important in Bible study discussions because sometimes we think our ideas come from scripture and then we learn that they do not, that they do not come from scripture. Um, One of my favorite uh, folks on Facebook, uh, they often quote uh, Marg Moscow uh, in her blog, which I often uh, refer to, Orthodox Barbie. She points to one of the, uh, she points to a quote from Marg and it says, Plutarch counsels that a husband's leadership should be done sympathetically and affectionately and should promote the wife's empl- uh, enjoyment and kindness. But the husband must be the ruler. Paul, on the other hand, never uses any of the words Plutarch uses about a husband's leadership. In fact, Paul and every other New Testament author never use any of the many Greek words for leader ruler, or authority in reference to husbands. Plutarch's frame of reference was the old patriarchal values of Greco-Roman society. Paul's frame of reference was the new creation in Christ. And so Orthodox Bobby made this meme and is quoting Marg Moscow. Now, here's what's interesting about that. And I'll include a link to that article. In, on our Patreon site, I uh, did a whole podcast on the word, on the word study for the word help meet. Why? Because in our cultural Christian context, we have a disordered view that's been normalized in our misinterpretation of what the word help meet means. Now, I don't have time to go into all of that here today, so you'll have to check it out on Patreon. But here's what's interesting. When we think of Marriage statistics. See, we talk a lot in the uh, Christian American, American Christian church. You hear a lot of pastors or preachers talk about, oh, the divorce rates among Christians are so high. Divorce rates are so high. They're so high. They're so high. This is such a problem. And on a website called lifesavingdivorce.com, they point out, that evangelical divorce rates will automatically drop when destructive, sinful behavior in marriage drops. If half of the divorces in the U.S. are due to a pattern of adultery, sexual immorality, physical abuse, emotional abuse, severe addictions, abandonment, or neglect, then that is the place to start. We need to discourage people with major marriage-endangering sins from marrying. They need to come before the Lord and work on their issues and prove themselves to be safe and reliable mates rather than hoping that marriage will automatically change them. We need to educate young people to identify and avoid potential spouses, even fellow Christians who have serious abuse, intimidation, coercion, addiction, or sexual immorality problems. We also need to give them permission to point out new or increasing marriage endangering sins that emerge during the marriage. Now I do marriage coaching. That's one of my side hustles. And it's interesting in pre-marriage coaching and even after the marriage has started, how often people ignore some of the red flags that were evident during the dating phase. Like if somebody's a control freak in the dating phase, they're a control freak when you get married. Um, So circling back to deconstruction and reconstruction, when Comer says deceptive ideas that play to disordered desires that are normalized in a sinful society. We allow, even in the church, because we have elevated 
uh, marriage, just as one example, this is not the whole thing, but just as one example, to the point that that's your life goal as a woman, when really to be more like Christ is our life goal. How many women in the New Testament do we see absent a spouse or with their spouse in a partnering relationship? And even in the Gospels, when Jesus talks about marriage, he references Genesis. Get back to the beginning, in the beginning, how it was in the beginning. And it's not an argument for or against same-sex marriage. It's an argument for partnership, for emotionally, spiritually healthy uh, <laughs> relationships. So when we talk about what it takes to move from that uh, that hamster wheel of deconstruction to reconstruction, what we're looking at is how do I make sure I am the most emotionally, spiritually healthy version of myself so that if I do decide to partner with someone else, I'm, I'm doing that in a way that does not bring them harm. Andy Stanley points out in uh, his book, Irresistible, that we talk about in the first season, he says, what does, he asked this question, what does love require of me? And when Jesus says, you will know my disciples by how they love. And Andy says, well, what does love require of me? Well, what love requires of me is to not bring harm to my fellow Christian, to not cause my fellow Christian to engage in sin. And so the benefit of moving to a space of reconstruction is to say, no, we really do need to take Jesus seriously. We really do need to take the Sermon on the Mount seriously. Um, and these ideas that we have, these deceptive ideas, actually come from the pagan culture that we continue to teach our young people in our schools because it is the foundation of our democracy. So, you know, here's the thing. Let me back up here because I'm not saying I'm not anti-democratic. Uh, I want to make sure I'm clear on this. In your run-of-the-mill public school, and even some of your Christian schools, you will learn about Greek philosophers, Greek philosophy. You will learn about the pagan deism of all the different gods in Rome and Greece, uh, the Greco-Roman uh, pantheon of gods. You learn about Jupiter and Zeus, all of our months of the year are named after them. You'll learn about uh, the, them as deities, how they operated, how the Greek people understood them. Um, we'll, learn, we'll learn about Aristotle and Plato and what they stood for and what they uh, believed. And what's interesting is that Aristotle and Plato believed that the body, the physical body of the human woman is a distorted version of the male body. You can look that up. So when you build your ethic, build your belief system of what it means to be a woman off of Greco-Roman ideals. Well, what ends up happening is you get the crazy version of the Shema that was showing up in the early uh, first, in the first century. See, there was the Shema, you know, uh, remembering uh, the prayer that, that devout Jewish people said every day. But in that intertestamental time where there was the influence of Alexander the Great, where there was the influence of Roman culture and the influence of uh, the Greek philosophers into Judaism, what you end up with are people praying every day, thank you, God, for not making me a woman. And so that invades or infiltrates how we interpret what Paul is saying about marriage, about uh he says, submit one to another as Christians. And then he talks about what that looks like in marriage, but we cut off the verse. So reconstruction, we've got to look at where did our ideas come from? They didn't come from scripture. I have an episode, uh, I think it's in season two, where I talk about uh, stop letting Aristotle teach your Bible study. Really ask yourself, where did these ideas come from? And so that brings me to another 
quote, and I may have shared this. This is the last book I want to mention um, today on the podcast. And that is The Complete Book of Discipleship on Being and Making Followers of Christ by Bill Hull. Um, He defines discipleship as being a learner, Uh, literally that you're committed to learning. And let's see, I flagged the pages here. Okay. He talks about how the Gospels contain stories of how Jesus confronted life, how he handled the poor, the sick, the unforgiven, and the self-righteous. As disciples, Hill writes, our quest should be to believe what he believed so we can live the way he lived. Paul told the church in Rome that we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. We see that in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Because the mind provides the base of operations for humans, we can't establish our life on a concept we can't grasp. So leaders around the world have found that what Jesus believed from the Sermon on the Mount, which literally, if you read it out loud, takes about 15 to 20 minutes. So if you imagine that the recollection of Matthew, the oral tradition in writing these things down that Jesus said, It changed the world. And being a disciple is an attitude. Its foundational trait is humility. But later in his book, Hull says this. He says, We might call non-discipleship Christianity the elephant in the room. And I feel like I may have shared this quote before in a, a slightly different or similar context, talking about why it's so important to move in a positive direction with spiritual formation, but how important it is to understand where our our ideas are coming from. See, we can't reconstruct, we can't get off that hamster wheel that Candace talks about. We can't change the marriage statistics if we're unwilling to admit that we allow the lies and gaslighting of Satan to say, you know what, it's okay, all men are lustful. But Jesus says, no, that's not acceptable, and get it together. And Paul reminds us, renew your mind. Well, what's in our mind? If we've spent K through 12 and some of college reading Aristotle and Plato as if that were the gospel, then we walk away from it and develop and create a culture that allows for non-discipleship Christianity. What do we mean by that? We mean that it's enough to go to church on Sunday and that's it. The rest of your life you you conduct as an American, um, as a just person floating around and, and, and then you walk around and you say, but I'm a good person. Well, yeah, you're good at being an American. Americans are individualistic. Our, our ethic is based on individualism. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Do you? YOLO. But that's not the ethic that's in the gospel. It's a community-based religion. It is an ethic of uh, what love requires is that I do not cause my fellow Christian, my brother or sister in Christ, to sin. It's not what we believe as Americans. And so he goes on to say, we deny that the elephant is there. We throw a huge tablecloth over it and call it a coffee table. But the cost of ignoring non-discipleship Christianity is staggering. We forfeit both a predominantly vibrant church and the fulfillment of the Great Commission. The Great Commission, by the way, is found in Matthew chapter 28, I think. Yeah, I've never really been good at quoting verses if it's not in front of me on a piece of paper, so I apologize for that. You can Google Great Commission. You know, Wikipedia's got it correct. We feed the element, Hulls, the elephant, Hull says, and it's, uh, he says it stays strong and dominant. What does the elephant eat? His favorite dish is that everyone's commitment level is acceptable. This entree comes with a side dish of meeting the demands of the immature and passive-aggressive underachievers. For dessert, the elephant gobbles up occupied church leaders forced to arbitrate conflict among people vying for power. Non-discipleship Christianity doesn't expect people to take the kingdom of God to work and make disciples. Who has time and energy for that? Instead, these non-disciples spend the majority of their time and effort keeping the elephant well-fed. 
but this results in less joy, weakened passion, and paltry fruitfulness. The cost is so high because non-discipleship Christianity leaves wasted lives. Life-changing experiences remain on the shelf. Pastors spend most of their time and energy trying to satisfy the prevailing desires of the congregation. And he goes on in this. So here's the thing that I, uh, last thing I want to share with you. We have this idea now of deconstructing to reconstruct, right? And one of the things that this requires is looking at where do our ideas come from? Because we're not discipling people according to Christianity. We're discipling people according to our American culture. What's important to function and grow or to be an American. So Christianity was based largely in the first few hundred years on oral tradition. It wasn't until the second century that we had the list from Tertullian that actually identifies what were considered the canon of the New Testament and what was considered the canon of what became refer, what we refer to as the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures. But the thing that, and I just taught on this the other day in our uh, Bible study because we're, we're going through the Gospels now, what we have to remember is that between what is written at the end of what we call the Old Testament and the beginning of the story of Jesus in the New Testament, it's 400 years. And I put it this way for those who were in Bible study with me the other day. Imagine you're watching a Netflix series, season one, and it ends and something dramatic happens and there's this expectation, this waiting. And then season two picks up and you're like, hey, what did I miss in that off time? Because season two picks up with something, hey, this is what's going on. But what happened in between the beginning of what was hoped for and the story about hope? That's what we're looking at. It's like the difference between season one and season two. So what ends up, what, what do they do on Netflix uh, series? They will tell you in one of the episode, early episodes of the new season, hey, here's what happened. Here's what you missed. Well, what did you miss between Malachi and Matthew? 400 years of history. When we leave the Jewish people at the end of what we ha uh, call the Old Testament, when we leave the Jewish people, they are subject to the Persian Empire. When we pick back up, they are subject to the Roman Empire. But guess what we miss? We miss a few, uh, we miss a short period of time, probably just over a hundred years, which is what, two or three generations maybe, where the Jewish people had independence or fought for their independence. Those are the books of the Maccabees. Uh, and they show up in the Septuagint. It's a history. It's where Hanukkah shows up. That's why when we look at the Old Testament, we're like, well, why they weren't celebrating Hanukkah in the Old Testament. But Jesus celebrated the Feast of Dedication in the New Testament. We see that. That's Hanukkah. Because it's not in our Bible. We miss it. It's in Maccabees. Uh, so we miss that part between season one and season two. The other thing that we miss is the entire life of an influence of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great and the, the Greek empire that took over most of the Mediterranean region and reached almost all the way to India. How does that affect the early church? Well, one, Koine Greek, common Greek is what our New Testament documents were written in, Hebrew for the Old Testament, Greek for the New. But here's the catch. Here's the thing. The Septuagint is the Greek language Old Testament. See, the Hebrew scriptures, because you had the Persians and the Babylonians and the, the Greeks and the Romans who took over and, and you had this influence in that 400-year period before the New Testament is written, because you have this influence of these other cultures, most of the Jewish people were now scattered throughout the Mediterranean region. And as they were scattered, they lost touch with their native tongue. So Hebrew was primarily used for religious services and limited to those who were right around Jerusalem in Judea. 
Actually, most people spoke a diver- derivative of Hebrew, which is Aramaic, which is what Jesus spoke. And it is believed by scholars that Jesus spoke Aramaic, Hebrew, and likely Greek. Paul, born in modern-day Turkey, probably was raised with Greek as his first language and learned Hebrew as a scholar as he was on track to be a Pharisee. So the thing that's important to understand is that the early church had a Greek-translated version of even their scriptures that influenced them. So what did we miss? We missed a whole major cultural shift of influence of language, of culture, of a way of seeing things. And guess what changes in this time? The Shema moves from just, you know, love the Lord your God to, and thank you God for not making me a woman because of the influence of Plato and Aristotle, the Greek philosophers, into the culture of the time. So as we reconstruct, the thing that we have to think about is what did, and I I talked about this as I taught on Galatians, and and this is where I think I'm going to end. How I sound like a black preacher, because I think I said 15 minutes ago I was ending. I shared this quote on... (laughs) On my Facebook page last January regarding Galatians 3.28. And later in the year, as I mentioned, I taught on the book of Galatians last fall. We went through probably 10 weeks of just going through the six chapters in Galatians, like with a fine tooth comb. And when we got to Galatians 3.28, it's the, the verse that says, neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. Um, I quoted back in January, N.T. Wright, and it's a long quote, and I'm going to end with this and then invite you to check out the Patreon site and invite you to join me next week where I walk through some of the resources for reconstructing your faith that I want to share with you and what it means to you, what resources are considered or you should consider safe books. So, Let's end with this from N.T. Wright. He says, This verse is often mistranslated such, neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. That is precisely what Paul does not say. Because it's what we expect he's going to say, we should note carefully what he has said instead. Since he presumably means to make a point by doing so, a point that is missed when the translation is flattened out as in that version. What he says is, is that there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, no male and female. I think the reason he says no male and female rather than neither male nor female is that he is actually quoting Genesis 1. And that we should understand the phrase male and female as a quotation. So does Paul mean that in Christ we cr- the created order itself is undone? Is he saying, as some have suggested, that we go back to a kind of chaos in which no orders of creation apply any longer? Or is he saying that we go on like the Gnostics from the first rather shabby creation in which silly things like gender differentiation apply to a new world in which we can all live as hermaphrodites, which again, some have suggested, and which has interesting possible ethical spinoffs? No. Paul is a theologian of new creation, and it is always the renewal and reaffirmation of the existing creation, never its denial, as not only Galatians 6, 15 through 16, but also Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 15 make so very clear. Indeed, Genesis 1 through 3 remains enormously important for Paul throughout his writings. What then is he saying? Remember that he is controverting, in particular, those who wanted to enforce Jewish regulations and indeed Jewish ethnicity upon Gentile converts. Remember the synagogue prayer in which the man who prays thanks God that he has not made him a Gentile, a slave, or a woman, at which point the women in the congregation thank God that you have made me according to your will. I think Paul is deliberately marking out the family of Abraham reformed in the Messiah as a people who cannot pray that prayer, since within this family such distinctions are now irrelevant. I think that there is more. Remember that the presenting issue in Galatians is circumcision. Male circumcision, of course, 
We sometimes think of circumcision as a painful obstacle for converts. As indeed in some ways it was, but for those who embraced it, it was a matter of pride and privilege. It not only distinguished Jews from Gentiles, it marked them in a way that automatically privileged males. By contrast, imagine the thrill of equality brought by baptism, an identical right for Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. So that's it. That's what I've got for today's episode. I realize this was a long one, but I think uh, it's probably consistent with other episodes. So welcome to season three for No More Silos. Thank you so much for listening. Follow me on Instagram. Share this podcast with your friends. Leave a comment or a or stars on your podcast app to let folks know that, hey, this podcast is worth listening to because that is how people will find us in Apple or Spotify is if you review the podcast and let people know that you like it. You're not just listening to it um, and keeping this information to yourself. I believe it was the song that I grew up singing, This Little Light of Mine. Uh, I'm going to let it shine. If this is light for you, let it shine. Let somebody else know um, that this podcast exists. No More Silos with Erica Santiago. Thank you so much and have a blessed rest of your day.